Well, we're not in the Blueprint series, but I wanted us to see this uh, video again today because it's such a great introduction to what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. And so, uh, you know, hearing these stories never gets old, does it? Man, I love to hear these stories of how God uses people. He reaches people through people. And uh, I love that. And uh, so whatever uh, your story is today, if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus, there is a someone who's responsible for influencing you to place your faith in Jesus. And, um, and so I want to ask the question to us again, just to kind of get us started. And that is, who is responsible for bringing you to Jesus? Who is responsible for influencing you to place your faith in Him, to follow Him, uh, to receive Him into your life? However you phrase that, um, who is that person? Do you have them in your mind? Sunday school teachers. Okay. That's fantastic. Fantastic. All right, so think, have the picture in your mind. Who is it? And just hold on to that for just a second because we're going to come back to that. But for me, as I mentioned on the video, this was my dad. My dad was the one that prayed with me to receive Jesus uh, into my heart and my life as a kid. And uh, for my dad now, it was a TV evangelist, of all things, in the corner of Alaska, not even, I think is 100 miles from Russia, is how far he was away, and he was watching TV one night, and, and watching this TV evangelist, and uh, God used that, and reached him uh, through that guy. Now, I don't know who is responsible for reaching that evangelist. I don't know his story. Um, but I know that there was a someone, right? And so I, this week, I, I wanted to kind of dig into this a little deeper, and I reached out to the people who were on this video that you just saw, and I said, okay, thank you for sharing for you know who reached you, but then do you know who was it that reached them? And so it kind of got mixed results, and some of us remembered, some of us di didn't. And, uh, and so um, you know, for Joanne, it was Trisha Hamner, but we couldn't really figure out much beyond that. And then uh, for, for Ashley, uh, it was her mom, you know, that led, led her to Jesus. Um, and then for Judy, it was Cora Beckett, but she didn't know, you know, who led Cora to the Lord. Um, and so uh, I told you I could go about two layers deep. Um, and so I tried to go back as far as we could through all of that. Now, we may not be able to trace our lineage back that far, but we know this, that along the way, a person was responsible for passing that faith onto you and onto them and then down to you, right? And so, um, Linda, I don't want to put you on the spot today, but I hope this is okay. I was talking to Linda a few, a few uh, weeks ago about her story and how uh, she um, was watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV, and that's whenever she, in, in her living room, right, uh, prayed to receive Christ into her life. And so she counts Billy Graham as one of those uh, people that's responsible for bringing her to Jesus, right? And um, so what's cool about this is that the story of Billy Graham's faith is well documented, right? You've probably heard the story of all the different people in his lineage, spiritual lineage, and how that worked out to reach him. So Billy Graham was led to Jesus by a guy named Mordecai Ham. He was an evangelist, and, uh, and Billy went to his uh, crusade and uh, was one to the Lord there. Uh, now, Mordecai Ham was led to Christ by Billy Sunday. Billy was led to Christ by Wilbur Chapman, who was led to Christ by D.L. Moody, which if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because D.L. Moody was a massively important and influential evangelist back in the 1800s. And he himself reached hundreds of thousands of people uh, for Christ. And so he is part of that spiritual lineage uh, from Billy Graham to Linda. And if you go back now, did you know that as of 2008, Billy Graham is estimated that Billy Graham has shared the message of Jesus with over 2.2 billion people? in his lifetime. Billion with a B. Is that not unbelievable? I have no idea how they came up with that number. 
But just the fact that he's even in the ballpark of billions with a B is an amazing thing. Through TV, through radio, through all of those decades, through his organizations all around the world, Samaritan's Purse, if you add all of that together, they've had the opportunity to share the message of Jesus with 2.2 billion people, which is un unbelievable. Now, the best part of this story is that there is someone who is responsible for even more people hearing the gospel than Billy Graham in this story. Because if you go back through the chain of people who were responsible for bringing Billy Graham to Jesus, there was a humble Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball who taught the junior high boys Sunday school class. And if you've ever taught junior high boys, you know that's not the most glamorous job in the church, right? Oh, come on. Y'all got to be more honest than that. He was the junior high boys Sunday school teacher. And yet he influenced one of those boys in his class to pray and invite Jesus into his heart and his life. And that boy's name was D.L. Moody. And so not only did D.L. Moody share the gospel with hundreds of thousands of people, but his influence extended all the way down to Billy Graham and to Linda McKnight, who's here this morning. Because of Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher. So how many people is Edward Kimball responsible for bringing to Jesus? Well, I did some calculations. I have no idea. But you can imagine, down through his chain, 2.2 billion is right here, just with one guy, and you got D.L. Moody over here. Who knows the extent of that influence of Edward Kimball in that Sunday school class? And that is just an amazing, amazing thought to me. And so this morning, we're going to look at this, and I know this, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you right now, but we're going to look at kind of this, uh, this chart here and go through this idea of the spiritual lineage um, because we're not done yet with that, okay? We're going to come back to this um, because eventually if we could all trace, if we could all do this, even back further than Billy Graham could, right? Because we only got back to the 1800s with him. But if we could all trace our spiritual ancestry back, 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 back to the beginning, we would, we would go all the way back to the first believers and the first disciples that walked with Jesus. And so maybe Joanne, maybe her lineage goes back through Tricia, through others, all the way back and back, back to James. Maybe Ashley goes back and back and back all the way to Paul. Maybe she's in that chain. Maybe, maybe Linda, if we keep going all the way back and follow it all the way back to the beginning, we're going to get to Peter, maybe. Or maybe for me, um, if, you, if you follow my lineage, maybe uh, it's, it's the Apostle John. For Renee, maybe it's Mary, Mary Magdalene. Who knows? But we know that the gospel is shared person to person to person. And if we follow that lineage all the way back, we will find our way to the disciples who walked with Jesus himself. Because ultimately, we, you and I, we're believers in Jesus because something happened in history. Something happened. And it sent shockwaves through the rest of history. And what happened was that a real man named Jesus walked this earth and he claimed to be God. And he had many followers and disciples, but then he was killed. He was crucified on a Roman cross, but then he shocks everybody by rising from the dead. And there were hundreds of witnesses of him living after he had died. And so these witnesses then shared their testimony. They shared their story of their firsthand experience with Jesus. From person to person to person, sometimes sharing under the threat of death and persecution, sharing their story. They said, this happened. I saw him with my own eyes. And they shared the story down, 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 person to person to person to person from generation to generation 
to generation to generation, all the way down to us here in Charlotte, North Carolina at United Wesleyan Church in 2017. Now, there are two things that we can learn from this amazing story right here, and that is, we've already talked about this one. Everyone who comes to Jesus is brought by someone. There is a someone responsible for that. The second one, though, and this is where I want to land today, is you never know what God may do through you or through your influence or the person you influence for Jesus. Can you imagine when Edward Kimball made it to heaven and found out what his lineage was going to be? How shocked he must have been to know that billions of people would have been impacted by his simple obedience to be a Sunday school teacher to junior high boys. That's an amazing, an amazing story. And so generation after generation, from person to person, our faith is passed down to us from Jesus to John to John's disciple, to John's disciple's disciple, to John's disciple's disciple's disciple, to the next person, to the next person, all the way down to us. Now, does this not place front and center for us the extreme importance of a couple things? And that is, one, of reaching the unreached, the mission that we've talked about with Blueprint. But also, where I want to focus today, the importance of each generation passing the faith down to the next generation, each generation passing it down to the next. And this is why I get so excited about the up, in, and out thing, is that each time one of us connects to up, in, and out here to God and, and here at United, you're joining this 2,000-year-old movement of God to reach and heal this planet. You're joining this story when you connect to the church now, when you connect to God and what He's doing now. And here we thought church was all about us, right? Not a chance. The church has always been about God's purposes and what He's doing to reach this planet and to reach all of us broken people here. But here's the thing. The movement goes back further than this. It's older than 2,000 years. If you go back to the book of Matthew in the Bible, the very first chapter in Matthew, if you remember, it's got all the begats in it, right? It's, it's that genealogy from, uh, I think it's from Abraham uh, to Jesus. And so you can trace Jesus' heritage all the way and lineage all the way back to Abraham there in Matthew. Now, in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, you can trace Abraham's lineage all the way back to Noah. Then if you keep going back to Genesis 5, you can trace Abraham's lineage, I'm sorry, Noah's lineage all the way back to Adam. Now, Here's where I'm going with this. So think about this. Adam was created by God. He actually walked with God in the Garden of Eden, and he passed on what he knew to his sons. This firsthand experience with God, who in turn passed it to their children, and to their children, and to their children, and to their children. From Adam to Noah to Abraham, to David, to Solomon, to Isaiah, to Jesus, to Peter, all the way down to us today. Now we're talking about a movement that's over 4,000 years old. And here we thought our faith was just a private matter. Not a chance. An individual thing? No. As followers of Jesus, we're part of this movement that's bigger than any of us, that's bigger than this church, and it stretches all the way back to the beginning to a garden where God created us. And that should blow our minds today. Because our faith is a faith that is passed down from generation to generation to generation. And each generation has this sacred responsibility to pass the faith down to the next generation. Psalm 78 describes this, and it's written from the perspective of a teacher. So all of you teachers will appreciate the way it's written. But Psalm 78 says, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. 
Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors have handed down to us. And we will not hide these truths from our children. No, we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. For He issued His laws to Jacob, He gave His instructions to Israel, and He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting His glorious miracles and obeying His commands. So one of the reasons why you and I have faith Why we're here today is because someone fulfilled their sacred responsibility to pass the faith down to us. They passed it down to their children or their grandchildren or to their neighbor's kids, and we were the beneficiaries of that. Now, add to this sacred responsibility that I'm talking about this morning to the current statistics on when people make their decisions to follow Jesus. Most people begin their walk with God before their 18 years old. I've shared this statistic with you before, that 90% of decisions to follow Jesus or become a Christian happen before the age of 18. 90%. That is an unbelievable statistic. Kids workers, did you hear that? Man, I hope you get that. So you understand the massive importance of your role. 90% of those decisions happen by the age of 18. This is why we say our kids' ministry may just be the most important ministry in our church. So if we take seriously the future of our church, we will make our kids' and our youth ministries some of the highest priorities as a church. And so as the older generations, we hold that sacred responsibility in our hands to pass the faith down to the next generation. To our amazing kids and our amazing youth. Didn't you love seeing the kids worship with us today? They're over here on the front row, and they're just soaking it in, right? They're watching, they're listening, they're looking around, and, uh, and they're just soaking it all in. And we're going to do this at least once a month so that they can see us older generations worshiping in addition to having their own place where they can worship in an age-appropriate way. We're, they're going to come in once a month so they can learn from us. And so we can get excited by seeing them. We also relaunched our youth group this past Wednesday night, and we had a group of seven teens. And let me tell you, these seven teens that came are awesome. I am so incredibly excited about the potential in these seven teenagers. In a fantastic beginning. And let me tell you, I was blown away by them. They're, as I mentioned to you earlier, they're an amazing young group of people that they're going to lead the way this Wednesday and reaching out to Seven Oaks. They're leading the rest of us. They're leading the charge there. They're going to make some serious waves for God's kingdom. I'm fully convinced of that. And we've all heard the old cliche, right? That our kids and our youth, they're the church of tomorrow. We've heard that cliche. But I'm just telling you, that's simply wrong. Because they're the church of today. They're the church of right here and right now. They have something to contribute right here and right now. And so if you want to see this in action, I invite you to come. Walk with us in Seven Oaks neighborhood on Wednesday and watch them lead the way. Because they will lead us. But talking about the next generation isn't just a church issue though, right? It's personal. I know it's personal for me because I have two kids under the age of five. And maybe you're in a similar place as me, or maybe you have grandchildren or nieces or nephews that fit into this age range of being under the age of 18. And so all of this begs the question for us, is that will we, as the older generations, commit to our sacred responsibility to pass down the faith? Will we commit to that? Let me ask that a different way. What would happen if there were no one to fill our shoes once we're gone? 
What happens to this movement? If there's no one to fill my shoes, if there's no one to fill your shoes when you're gone, would we be content with losing that next generation from the church? Because today's message isn't about the next generation. It's about us older folks. And yes, I included myself in older folks. Now I have to admit, I don't understand much about what you old people are thinking. I don't know yet the value of Metamucil or Velcro shoes or Ben Gay. I don't understand all of that quite yet. But listen, I do know that I'm, a, I'm closer than I once was. I may still think and feel like I'm 25 and fresh out of college and still cool. But man, I'm finding out more and more reminders that I'm 38 and I'm not nearly as cool as I used to be. And the music these days is just not as good as it used to be, right? It's just not. So when I say older generation, I'm talking about all of us adults in our middle ages and up, which actually encompasses two or three generations, right? And so this question is posed to all of us here. Would we as the older generations be content with losing the next generation from the church? And this is not a hypothetical question. It's not a hypothetical question. This actually happened before. There's a story in the Bible that tells when one particular generation did not talk to the next one. This older generation didn't share the things they knew about faith, about life, and about God's goodness with this younger generation. And it led to disaster. And so the story I'm referring to is in the Bible. It's in the book of Judges. And we read this disturbing verse here in Judges chapter 2. You can read with us on the screen. It says, the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. This personal experience, firsthand experience with God, right? Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and then they buried him in the land of his inheritance. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, what that means is they had passed away. So basically, all the people who had sat under the, the, the leadership of Moses, all who had followed Joshua, they've all died now. They're all the ones who experienced God's deliverance out of Egypt. They wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. They had eaten manna. They had entered the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to them. All of that generation has now died. And this is the result. It says another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what He had done for Israel. Now, the Hebrew word for know here doesn't mean like awareness. It's more like acknowledgement, which, in other words, it's like this coming generation. They weren't ignorant of the things of God. They had heard about it. It's just that they had refused to embrace it. They weren't seeing it modeled for them. And so what this younger generation wrestled with was unbelief. And so as someone who loves the church, who values this movement of Christianity, of God's plan, who believes in this amazing hope that Jesus brings, this should trouble us that it only takes one generation to wipe out hundreds of years of faithfulness. And so if this were to happen again, uh, in our day, it's important us, for us to understand that it's not the fault of one generation when that happens. It's the fault of two or more generations. Because every generation needs another. Every younger generation needs an older generation. And every older generation needs the younger generation. And we need each other. Yes, the next generation is extremely important, but listen to me, older generations out there, you are also crucial. You are crucial to this whole deal. And so it saddens me anytime I hear someone young talking down on the older generation. It's sad. We younger folks stand on your shoulders. You've gotten us this far because you were faithful. You have a ton of life experience to help us younger 
people, as we live out our lives, our marriages, our families, our careers, and yes, the church. You have a wealth of experience to share with us. And I'm also saddened to hear some in the older generation say, you know, I've done my share, I've put in my time, I've done my work, it's time for someone else to step up. That saddens me too, because we need you. I mean, have you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? I mean, what if, what if the Apostle John had said that in his late 80s? You know, he's, he's exiled out on the island of Patmos and the angel comes to him to give him the revelation or whatever. What if he's like, yeah, you know what, angel? I've already written a gospel, a few letters. I think I'm good. I've done my time. I'm going to hang it up. No, I don't think so. We might retire from our jobs, but we never retire from God's mission and His plan for our lives. We never retire from God's kingdom. That never, never happens because the generations in our church need each other. We need each other. The older generations need the energy and the excitement of the younger generations and their technical knowledge. And we need to defer to them in many areas of church life where we can so that we can reach them and grow them up in the Lord. And the younger generations need the older generations for your wisdom and life experience and to hear your testimonies like you were sharing this morning of God's faithfulness and goodness and how trustworthy He is. They need to hear that. Because we younger folks, especially my age and younger, we've seen way too many stories of scandal, corruption, lack of authenticity from our leaders, whether it's in the church or outside the church. And so what we're looking for is something that's real, something that's true and trustworthy. And we desperately need to see that realness and that authenticity, that honesty from our older generations. All the studies show that the generations of young folks in their 30s and younger right now are mostly looking for three things. What's real and true. Think about it. We grew up on screens. Either our iPhones or our iPads or a computer screen or something like this. And that's fine, but it's all virtual. We've grown up in a virtual world, and so we want to know what's real. What's the real thing? And what's true? We're also looking for people who are authentic and not fake. They're not putting up a front because all we're used to is our screens with the airbrushed and edited images putting that front up. And we never know what's really behind it. And we're looking for people who will be honest. Give us the truth, man. And so you older generations are uniquely qualified to share these things with us, with our young people. But you have to speak that truth in love and in humility. Because young people smell pride and arrogance from miles away. Why? Because pride and arrogance isn't real. We know better. We know you don't have it all together. And so I don't, I don't really think I have to work very hard to convince all of you of this, right? I see a lot of heads nodding out there. The trick is defining how we do this. How do we make this work? And so I don't have all of this worked out. I wish I did. Because if I did, I'd write a book and make a lot of money off of it. And then I would tithe it, Brother Jerry. But I can offer some practical things that will help us, I think, Taking our cue from Psalm 78 that we just read a few minutes ago, because there's some practical things that we can do that the older generations can help lead the way in passing down the faith to the next generation. And so number one, we're going to move through these quickly. One is you can serve in the kids' ministry or the youth ministry. This is kind of step one, right? This is an area where the older generations here at United, you guys are shining. Man, you love on our little ones so well. You really do. And I see this on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays at Awana and 
to be completely honest, we would not have a kids' ministry without the older generations and the teenagers working together to make that happen, which is a beautiful thing. I love that. Another thing that we can do, the older generations can do, is to serve and support the parents of our kids and youth. By far, the most important place for spiritual formation happens in the home led by the parents. That's where, that's where it's at. But man, let me tell you, parents are tired. They're stressed out and they're busy. Parenting in today's world can be exhausting. And one of the ways that the older generations can serve the parents is just every so often offer to watch their kids so the parents can go out and reconnect, go grab dinner, stay close in their own relationship, which ends up being massively important to that little kid. Because when their parents are close, man, their world is so much better. Parents who can get a break from the kids to catch their breath and reconnect with each other and actually have a real conversation are in a much healthier place to raise their kids. I don't think I knew this until just recently and when Katie and I have a phone conversation and the kids are, are with one or the other, I mean, it probably takes 10 minutes to have a two minute conversation. You know what I mean? And another one, older generations, this one's huge. Be an impromptu encourager and mentor to the next generation. This is not something we program, okay? This has to be a culture thing. This has to be an awareness thing. This has to be something that we just all own for ourselves. But be an encourager to our young folks, especially when you see them serving in the church. Encourage them. Spark a conversation with them. Pat them on the back. Ask them how their week has gone. Encourage them. Be their cheerleader. And when you do that, it doesn't matter your age. When you do that and you show that you care for them, over time you're going to build a relationship with them from which they will turn to you for advice and guidance. Which is exactly what should happen. Now, there's also some practical things that we as a church can do to help make this an intergenerational church. There's some things that we can do that help us pass the faith down here at United. So I'll, I'll move through these pretty quickly too. But our Sunday morning kids leader, Jennifer Mahaley, you know her. She's planning, as I mentioned, to have the kids in here once a month so that they can see you worship. And they take in worship at an adult level. And then beyond that, they're going to contribute to our worship services on a regular basis too. Another one that we can do is, is that our youth will not be separated out to their own area and do church their way. No, they're the church of today. They have a role to play right here and right now. The current statistics say, I've shared this with you before too, but this is just so important, that 80% of our youth will drop out of church between the ages of 18 and 28. This is why there's a church crisis in America right now. It's because once they graduate high school, many of them go and they never come back. Because they feel like they don't have a place. Once they graduate out of that youth group, they don't know where else to go. And then, okay, well, maybe you have a young adult ministry. Well, when do you graduate out of that? You always, it always comes back to You've got to find your place. You've got to be able to plug in and find your place. And so I believe that one of the reasons for this statistics is that we've over-separated our teenagers from the life of the church. Over the past 30 years of our youth ministry culture, listen, I was one of them. Well, I guess I still am now as of Wednesday. But we've put our youth into their own space, their own worship, doing their own thing. And that's not necessarily bad. They need their own space. But when we take it too far and we create this church within a church, this youth church instead of inside of big church. I hate that term, big church. Then our youth don't know what to do or where to go within the church when they graduate. Because it's been so separated out. And so if we include them now and empower them now early on, I don't believe we'll see that kind of disconnect when they get older. Because I've seen this work in other places. 
So we're going to encourage every youth, every teenager to serve and plug, plug in outside of the youth group. And so when they graduate from the youth group, guess what? They won't be shocked when they have to go to big church because they'll already have a place to go, a role to fill. They'll already be plugged in. But to make this work, guys, we need mentors. We need encouragers. We need big brothers and big sisters to be the cheerleaders and the informal coaches of these guys. We need the older generations like you and me to defer to the younger generations where possible so that we can better reach them and raise them up. The third thing that we can do on a practical level to, to help us with this is that we're going to do our best to support the parents of our youth and our kids. Parents are by far the most influential people in our kids' lives. Uh, hands down, bottom line, by far the most influential. Our kids' ministry can help. Right, But we only get these kids two or three hours a week. And they're in your homes for 20, 30, 40, 50 hours. You know, we just can't compete with that. And so what this means is that our priority in kids' ministry will have to become resourcing parents. It has to become that, to help them raise their kids to know Jesus personally. That has to be our priority. So parents, one of the best things, if you want to know right now how to kind of get started, one of the best things you can do for your children is just to pray with them. Have a regular prayer with them, like really pray with them. Yeah, teach them to memorize prayers too, right? God is great, God is good. Teach them all of that too. But then also actually pray real prayers from your heart with them and encourage them to do it. Because something spiritually powerful happens when a, when a child hears their parents pray. And when a parent hears their child pray. So parents, if you want to know a place to start, start there. That's easy. You don't have to go buy anything. You can just simply pray with your kids at night before they go to bed. You pray and let them go next. Maybe it'll take them a little while. It's taken Marley a little while to actually do it because she gets embarrassed. But man, she prayed a prayer the other night that melted my heart. And so whatever we do as a church, it's vitally important that our generations value each other. And this must be true not only in our church, but in our families. Because when something moves from generation to generation to generation, when something is passed down from father to son, mother to daughter, teacher to student, mentor to mentee, and this happens for generations, you know what we have? We have a movement then. But what can destroy that movement is division. And that movement is only as strong as our youth. Generations are united. So what if our generations at United joined forces? What if we were one of the rare sets of generations that stood back to back against the work of the evil one in our culture and said, you know what? You can no longer have our children. You can no longer have our schools. You can no longer have our families. What if we adopted into our worldview that the movement is stronger when there's generational oneness, not generational division? What if we stood back to back as we confronted the divisive issues confronting the church? The way to return the church to this movement kind of status is to not the, let the world know that all the things we stand against and all the things that divide us, the way to return us to a movement it's to fall on our knees in one united cry for help from an almighty God and to pray together. So why are we here today? Psalm 78. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their children so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting 
His glorious miracles and obeying His commands. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to be a united group, a united church. Lord, as your people, we want to be united in serving one another, mutually serving one another. Jesus, we're reminded of your prayer for all of your followers and all of your disciples in John 17 when you said, Lord, make them one as you and I are one, that the world may know so that the people around us see our bond, they see our unity, and they say, you know what, something's different about those people. And we'll say, yeah, it's Jesus. And we know that our witness will be so much stronger when we, each generation, serves each other. We defer to one another. We mutually serve the other. Lord, thank you for these dear people. I see them doing this in so many ways already. And so, Lord, today is just a recommitment. Today is just a reevaluation of our lives to say, God, what would you have me do? How can I do this? How can I be an encouragement to the next generation? How can I be an encouragement to the, the young ones coming up? For some of us, we may want to serve in that ministry, but for others of us, we may just need to be a cheerleader. But Lord, whatever it is, I pray in this moment as we just quiet our hearts, Lord, that you'd bring to the surface, bring to mind what you're calling us to. Lord, give us wisdom, give us guidance and direction for how we can pass the faith down to the next generation.